welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger. We're missing Brian Broom today. But we have come to the last days of the kingdom of Judah and the prophecy of Habakkuk. Or how do you say it, Greg? Habakkuk. It's apparently more Just fun because that it's, way. Fun, it's more fun to say it that way. <laughs> I don't know if it's any more accurate. It's so, a little, little book buried in the minor prophets that no one can ever find. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just off the top of my head, I can't even identify the part of the song that it comes in. <laughs> <laughs> because Zephaniah, that's how Haggai, everyone Zechariah. learned yeah. the minor prophets, right, from the song. Jonah, uh, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. There we go. I found it. So it Good. comes after Nahum, if you're wondering. Mm. Or if you're on your Bible app, you just type in H-A-B and <laughs> go. Um, but the themes that we are looking at in the book of Habakkuk are hope and despair, or rather faith and despair. Mm -hmm. Do these come at the very beginning of the book? Are they telegraphed? How, <laughs> how, do, these, how do they come in? Well, Habakkuk is writing, as you say, in the last days of the kingdom of Judah. Uh, it isn't quite clear to Habakkuk what direction the future is going. But he knows that the culture surrounding him is full of wickedness and violence, uh, sexual sin, drunkenness, idolatry. In other words, a lot like today. <laughs> and uh, being a man who fears God, he comes before the Lord and points out all this and says, Lord, you really should do something about this. This is, this is horrible. All of this is happening. And... Well, let me just read a little. Therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. In the courts, in society, everything's wrong. Every, all the important people are doing, making all the wrong decisions. It's just absolutely horrible, Lord, with the implication of, and you need to do something about this. Why aren't you doing something? Why, why do you show me iniquity? How long shall I cry and you won't hear? He could be living today. And God answers him. He says, Behold you among the heathen in regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. Okay, God's going to do something. That's great. It's going to be something spectacular and unusual, something you aren't even going to believe is happening. Okay, I can handle that. Yeah, Um I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land. What? Mm, that's not what we were hoping for. Uh, yeah, that, this this is not really it. Um, he, and God goes on and describes the Chaldeans in some military detail. And he goes on to say that in the end, um, the, the Chaldeans are going to be so successful that they will give all the praise to their God. Like, we got the coolest gods because we got the coolest army because we're just conquering everybody left and right. Aren't we cool? And Habakkuk uh, does not exactly know what to do with this. He says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. He's putting that out as, right, we're not going to die. <laughs> we're, we're, there's nothing in here about us absolutely dying and not existing anymore, either personally or as a nation. O oh Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. Thou hast established them for correction. Okay, got that. We need correction. We need to be chastised. And we are going to come out of this alive somehow, to some degree. But then a theological uh, question rises before his eyes. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. So why are you using the Chaldeans who are more wicked than we are to punish us for our wickedness? That doesn't seem like the God I'm supposed to know. God is holy and just. How can he pick up a really wicked weapon to punish a relatively wicked people? Why not? Um, I don't know what Habakkuk was thinking. Maybe he just <laughs> thought God will just step in and do something directly. He doesn't seem to be expecting revival. Uh, he seems to be 
expecting some kind of judgment, something that will stop the evil, but he hasn't mentioned the outpouring of God's Spirit or any such thing. But when he looks at who's going to be the instrument, it's just too much. <laughs> he can't he can't wrap his head around this one. And it kind of you know, I think of the saying God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick mm -hmm. where the the point is that the instruments God uses, the people, are still sinful people. Yeah. And the point is it, there aren't any others. Like of all the <laughs> nations that should have been upright. Israel should have been it. They had yeah. this relationship with God, this covenant relationship, and they're the ones who need rebuking. Mm -hmm. It's just deeply ironic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, 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 yeah. Mm. Well, Habakkuk finishes his protest and says, well, no kidding, they're going to give all the credit to their God because you're just letting them get away with murder, or more or less literally. And for a time, God falls silent. And we move into the second chapter, Habakkuk says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. <laughs> so <laughs> he decides, I will wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to be patient. I'm not going to badger God. I really would like an answer now, but it's not coming apparently. So I'll wait. And I'll think about this and think about what maybe God's going to say, and then think about how I'm going to respond when he says that, which actually makes me look like an idiot or a rebel, depending on how this is going to play out. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he's going to ask, I mean, think back to Job. Job was, God demanded that Job answer him, and Job was lame. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it's got to be, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it without even really knowing what I'm, what I'm thinking about. And time passes, and then God does answer. The Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that is, write it in some kind of book form that will be permanent, that he may run that readeth it, so that someone can run up to this thing, look at what I've, what I've said, and then run off and tell everybody. This is not a secret. It's going to be permanent. It's going to be from generation to generation. Here it is. Here it is. I'm going to tell you what it is. And but you got to wait for it, and it's going to come in its due time. But it, it it will come. Here it is. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, at first glance, I suspect that that sounds a little um, like a letdown. Looking for something really profound with lots of multisyllable <laughs> words and cross references to all kinds of passages and. Um, backed up by some treaties on theology. The first part, the soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. So the proud man's not upright. Uh, Lord, knew that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so, I came here for some amazing sign. I didn't want like a moral judgment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, all right, so you're talking about uh, us, we're our pride. We're lifted up. Okay. Oh, or are you talking about the Chaldeans? Wait, could she be talking about both of us? But they're pagans and we're your people. Oh, we might both be guilty of pride <laughs> and, and, and not be right with you. And you will deal with that. So it has nothing to do with ethnicity or religious background, or what rites and ceremonies you passed through, or who your parents were, or what promises God gave in the past. It has to do with whether or not you're proud and lifted up. Well, as, as Habakkuk meditates on the law, really at hyperspeed, yeah. all right, yes, yes. Okay, Psalms, Proverbs, yes, Ecclesiastes, yeah, Job, for sure. Okay. So God is no respecter of persons. God holds all of the proud accountable. He brings them all to naught, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Okay. Now, how about the second part, though? But the just shall live by his faith. Again, it may sound like a, a simple moralism, a religious truism. And yet, uh, Paul in Romans, and then in Galatians, and the writer of Hebrews, both take this verse and build major arguments and, and multiply words and chapters in the New Testament based on this one 
obscure verse from this one obscure minor prophet, the just shall live by his faith. And um, when I taught through this in Bible study, oh, several months ago now, uh, we, we worked through the Habakkuk passage here, and then I spent one a further night seeing what Paul does it in Romans, and then another and what he does it with in Galatians, and then finally a third night and what the writer of Hebrews does. And it took that much time just to mm -hmm. milk it for for what's on the surface in the New Testament. So we're not going to do justice to it tonight, but there are some things we can say. There are three words that are important, just, live, and faith. First is, how are you right with God? I mean, where, as, as Habakkuk is honest with himself and honest about his people, he can figure out pretty quickly, well, we're all proud. Part of the reason that I'm objecting is I'm proud over the fact that um, God is using Gentiles to judge us because we're better than them, aren't we? <laughs> oh, wait, you mean we're not? No. Oh. That's pride, isn't it? My, my, in, in, I was condemning my own people. Wait, was there a pride in that, maybe? But then when I heard about the Chaldeans coming, I was, I was really upset because we should be better than them. We are better than them. We have the promises. We have Abraham to our father. Uh, okay. So if this is so, if we're all guilty of pride and our, our souls are lifted up, we're all, it's all about us, then how shall a man be right with God? And again, his mind might but go back to Job. How shall a man be just with God? It's a good question. God is holy and just, infinitely so. He demands a perfect righteousness. And Habakkuk, as he considers these things, can, can really quickly realize, well, just at a superficial glance, I'm not perfect. And further consideration will show me how not perfect I am. And I can look at my people, and they're worse than I am, and the Chaldeans are worse still. But we're all, we all have this in common. None of us measures up to the righteousness of God. So do we all fall in the first category of being proud and our souls lifted up and God's going to judge us? But is there some other kind of righteousness then? And we'll skip to the third word, which is faith. Faith means belief of the truth, and it means trust. Um, the answer of the Heidelberg Catechism, what is true faith? True faith is not only a certain knowledge, that is a sure knowledge, whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to me in his word, but it's also a hearty trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel. And it goes on to tell us what that certain knowledge and certain truth is. It's about Jesus and the salvation he provides. That, that faith that, first of all, it's an informed faith. It knows stuff. It's not just a, well, I hope things will turn out. I have confidence in confidence alone. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's belief in something God has revealed. You, so first you have to know it. But then you have to believe the message, and that means believing the person who gave the message. Do we trust the gospel or do we trust God? Yes, <laughs> because the message is from God. And to believe his words is to believe him, to trust the words is to trust him. And this, so being in a right relationship with God somehow hinges upon not that I've done everything I should have, but that I can trust God to somehow cover all that I have not done and all the wrong things I have done. So righteousness by faith, and as Habakkuk contemplated this, his mind might go back to Genesis chapter 15, where Abraham looks at the stars of heaven and believes God's promise that his seed will be equally innumerable. And Abraham believes God and it's counted to him for righteousness. Paul will turn, will develop the phrase justification by faith. But then there's the other word, the second word, live. Not simply be alive and survive, but live. And um, this this is something the writer of Hebrews spends a lot of time with. When he comes to talk about faith, he he mentions, yes, you're right with we're right with God by faith. And he keeps that, he keeps bringing it up again and again. But a lot of a lot of what he does in the chapter we all know, Hebrews eleven, the faith chapter, Hebrews of faith, he keeps coming back, and so became heirs of the righteousness which is by faith. So he had this testimony that he pleased God. Um Again and again, that's there. And yet the focus of the chapter is these great men and women of faith lived by their faith. Hmm. 
They didn't, it wasn't just a one-time thing that brought them to God in Christ. It wasn't something that saved their souls for heaven and then you put on a shelf and pick it up occasionally, look at it. But it is the motivating force and power and direction mm-hmm. of their lives. Mm-hmm. And that that's what Habakkuk needs to know. Well, why would you need to know that? Well, Habakkuk's already seen why you need to know that. The world is confusing. God's providences are confusing. God's sovereign reign is confusing. You know, it all comes up in the, now, if I were God, I would. <laughs> yeah, let's see, that's it. I have noticed many times in the last several months, particularly, that I'd be really rotten at being God. <laughs> um, if I were God, I would do it this way. And then I stop myself and say, and Lord, I know that they, that this is not how you're going. I don't know how you're going to do this, but I know you're not going to do it my way because it's my way and my way has got to be wrong. Um, you know, I'm all, I'm all for the s- s- smite them a good deal kind of thing. Um, but God has much subtler ways. And uh, maybe now is the time to pull back the veil a little. And what Habakkuk does not know, and and is not exactly told. So the Chaldeans are coming. They're going to overrun your nation. They're going to uh, lay siege to Jerusalem and take it. Your king's going to be under their thumb for a while. Your people are going to be rebellious and stupid until they draw down the wrath of the Chaldeans, at which point the Chaldeans will come and will obliterate your city, destroy the temple, raise it to the ground, Take all of your people captive, carry them away to Babylon and points beyond, and you're going to be there for 70 years, all of you. At the end of that time, I'm going to bring a lot of you back, but by no means all. A lot of you are just going to stay in pagan lands, and you're going to settle down and have kids, and they're going to have kids, and you're going to keep spreading and moving and being merchants and pursuing the call of the road until eventually you're going to have communities all over the Babylonian Empire, and after that, the Persian Empire, and after that, the Greek Empire, and after that, the Roman Empire, you guys are just going to keep spreading out all over the place, and many of you will never come back to Israel, but a remnant will, and they're going to rebuild the temple and the city, and they will be under the thumb of yet another pagan dictator, and then another one after that, and then another one after that. Their their time of freedom will be, and self-determination will be very brief, and yet in all of this... I'm setting things up for Messiah to come because the the Babylonians are going to take you captive and bring you back, or not, they're going to take you captive and spread you all over the place and you're going to keep going. There's that. So eventually there'll be Jewish communities spread throughout the known world with their synagogues, their preaching stations, with their their Old Testament, completed Old Testaments, bearing witness to the Gentiles around them, worshiping every Sabbath day and telling them that there's this, this Messiah, the Savior who's coming. The next empire is going to send you back home, protect you, and rebuild the temple. The third empire is really going to be annoying insofar as it's anything, but they're going to spread their language all around the world, and it will be the language that I'm going to write the rest of Scripture in. And then the fourth empire, they're just going to be mean and nasty and vicious and stomp on everybody, but in the process, they'll do that to everybody equally. So, hey, the world will call it peace, and there will be roads and post services, and they'll administer rather impartial justice so that for a few hundred years, you'll be able, my people, my servants will be free to go all over the world and declare the advent of Messiah. Habakkuk didn't get to know any of that. <laughs> what he got to know was, I'm God, I'm in charge, I, I got a plan. Trust me, one day at a time, moment by moment, what seems to be coming may seem overwhelming, impossible. How can the kingdom of God ever go through, go forward in this? How can a Messiah ever come? Is there an end? Will the, will the wicked always prosper? Will the righteous always be under their thumb? And, and God's answer is, no, but I'm not telling you how it's going to work. If we had a book that chapter by chapter told us our future, year by year, month by month, who we're going to marry, how many children we're going to have, where we're going to live, what our investments are going to be, what callings we will move through, where we'll work, who our boss will be, whether they'll be nice bosses or bad bosses, (laughs) uh, how many grandchildren we're going to have, uh, who's going to be the next president and the president after that and the president after that, what the next five major decisions the Supreme Court will. If we had that, our lives would require very little in the way of faith. We would just say, oh, as days pass, look, 
what God said happened. Oh, it happened again. Oh, look, it happened. This is just a book full of checking off all these things that God said would happen. Isn't it nice to know all that God knows that pertains to me? So I never have to worry about anything. I feel like we'd also be rather disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the book. <laughs> I read the book. Yeah. But notice the and worry. There's, there's nothing but what's in the book. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to worry. Do we have to worry? Or do we choose to worry? <laughs> As we look at the world around us, do we fall into despair? Is that because, well, no one can be hopeful in the midst of this? Or is it because we refuse to trust a sovereign God? Sometimes our theologies are so bad that we don't even know what the word sovereign means. You know, you know, there are evangelical Christians who don't know what the word sovereign means. There are evangelical Christians who have never heard the word, first of all. So I haven't got a clue. But there are people who who hear sovereign and, and they don't understand what that means. They think, well, really big, really powerful, but does according to his will in the armies of heaven above and the inhabitants of the earth, and then can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Who works all things together for the counsel of his own will, who orders that all things work together for all things work together for good to them who love him, to them are the called upon his purpose. You mean my sickness, the death of my child? I lost my job, the fire that wiped out my whole town. God ordained that? That's not a nice God. I don't like that. Well, that's the God you got. Would it be more comforting if all those things happened and God had absolutely no control over them? No. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it would not. That would be frightening, I think. But then we're thrown back with a back of, all right, Lord, you have a plan. It's obviously not my plan. This is not the way I would do it. You are wiser than I am. You are holier than I am. You love your people more than I love them or more than I love myself in any right sense. So I'm going to believe, I'm going to trust that you know what you're doing and that you're not going to let anything fall through your fingers. I am going to believe that all things work together for my good. And though all things may not in the moment be equally good, some things, things that hurt, hurt. Things that are sad are sad, yes. But there is a point, and there's a process, and there's a plan, and in time, God will accomplish his purposes. And when he's all done, they may not look at all like what we thought they would look like. Just to give you one example that comes readily to mind, in the wake of the Reformation, a lot of Christians in the Protestant tradition were looking for a second Reformation. It's got to be coming soon, right? I mean, God started the process. He'll do another Reformation. Guess what? He never did. Not like that. Well, then there came the revivals. Oh, that's it. God's going to do revivals. <laughs> and particularly in America. Great awakenings. The great awakenings. The first awakening and the second awakening. And the, you know, then they go on and on and on. And they all are less and less effective than the ones that came before. And we keep waiting for, well, God will send us a great revival. Yeah, not done it that way yet. Maybe he will. Maybe there is another Reformation coming up, but I doubt it's going to look like the first one. It, it can't. <laughs> the world is not now it's what it not, was then. Exactly. It's not the same world. To, to pick for a moment upon our uh, Scots friends, because they're easy to pick on, <laughs> do we really expect the whole world to sing Scots metric psalms in with a Scottish dialect <laughs> um, all across the world one day. And I think, and that at least at one time, there were probably Scots Presbyterians who said, well, of course, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> and I, no, any more than America is going to be replicated all over the globe. There was a time when it was America. Well, that's how God does things. Now, every nation needs to look like America. We need to export Republican democracy, whatever we call the thing. And that hasn't worked so well. Uh, God is constantly, God is the God of newness, the new thing he does in the earth. Mm -hmm. And we, we make a mistake when we think that God's going to take us back to some point in history and make it like that again. If we could only go back to colonial America, Puritan New England, Elizabethan England, to G Calvin's to Geneva. Well, how about just the antebellum South? How about the Victorian age? Oh yeah, that's a place to, Jane Austen. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I don't want to. The 1950s and leave it to Beaver. That'd be great. Well, Camelot. Camelot. <laughs> Alfred's England. We, we pick times and places and we think, wow, these were really great times. If the world were just like this, well, all of those things stopped being what they were because they were imperfect 
And because they eventually, because of their imperfections, they eventually collapsed into something that wasn't so hot, that wasn't so good. Uh, I do not want to go back to the 1950s. I was born at the tail end of the 1950s, and I don't see anything hopeful there. I see a lot of taking God and Christianity and the Christian legacy for granted, and very little in the way of a real, solid, earth-changing faith and, and, and theology. Uh, this We are where we are. We stand with new challenges, and they're scary. And the world's not the safe world our grandparents knew. So, we trust God. We live by faith. Uh, in my original article, I referenced uh, the book Witness by Whitaker Chambers, which I've never read, unfortunately. <laughs> but you have, so I'm going to let you talk about it in just a second. For um, younger folk, which may be most of our audience for all I know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> most with, of it at least. <laughs> <laughs> Whitaker Chambers was a man who got back in the 1950s, got mm -hmm. pulled into the communist conspiracy. He's an educated man, a writer, but he fell into such despair over the political and economic conditions of the world uh, that he saw no hope, no hope in Christianity or the gospel or the church, which he was more or less familiar with. It wasn't that communism looked good. It just looked like the only answer on the table and he joined the Communist Party. In the end, though, he became disillusioned, broke from it, and turned, lived to tell on his fellow communists, for which, of course, they never forgave him, and his book Witnesses. Which he didn't really want to do. No. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about him? I think it's worth, oh, sure. worth the time. Yeah. As you say, he, he saw communism as the answer to the Great Crisis. Uh, that he saw in, he'd call it a crisis of history, where everything is falling apart, there is nothing but strife, and this condition in which he found himself, the world in which he found himself was unsustainable. Um, there had to be an end to it, and he believed the right and proper end was communism. Communism was not really all it was cracked up to be in his experience. <laughs> He um, he was a member of the, the Open Communist Party, um, and then it was a little bit self-defeating in its politics, as we can observe <laughs> the, uh, the whole Trotskyite witch hunt mm -hmm. um, sort of. It, the, the Communist Party keeps purging itself of its right. greatest adherents. It's a common <laughs> recurring problem. Throughout yes. its history. Sort of like the French Revolution, but go yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Much in common with the French Revolution. Um, so he, he broke with the Open Communist Party, but he was still a communist and would say so in in his soul, as it were. Um, and then he was looped into the communist underground, which required that he remain apart from the public communist party worked for, I want to say the State Department, but my memory is failing me. <laughs> but he worked for the U.S. government and reported things, helped to smuggle documents. And he describes in his book, Witness, the structure of the various communist apparatus, the different rings that they had, how they distributed information so that nobody knew too much. Nobody really knew the other members of the underground. They knew only the people that reported to them and who they reported to and only by false names and that sort of thing. So I forget where I was going. I'm I'm off on a rabbit trail <laughs> because it's a, it's a very interesting story if you're interested at all in how secret stuff, secret societies function. Um. Well, it's a good antidote to those who poo-poo the idea that communism had any real presence or was any real threat. Right. You can get the idea from from mainstream history books that yeah. it was all just a witch hunt and mm -hmm. it was meaningless. And, you know, this this guy, Whitaker Chambers, sold out Alger Hiss. And they'll pass over the fact that Alger Hiss was guilty and yes. <laughs> his, his activity led to the deaths of thousands of people because they were smuggling military secrets to Russia. Yeah. Um, so real facts, 
he so he was um he was part of the Russian conspiracy um communism and r- support for uh Russia were interchangeable and inseparable mm-hmm. and he didn't want to join the underground his wife said please don't mm-hmm. and it was only because he couldn't really get out of it and keep his family safe that he joined then eventually he had to take it a great risk to flee the communist party again i was going somewhere with this and like there was a very clear direction and i got distracted because it's a cool story um where was i going with this greg <laughs> i i don't know i i i have a vague i've been told the story of his conversion do you remember that oh all? oh yeah um so he had had contact with um the quakers from early in his life Not throughout his life as a strong thing, but it was something that made an impression on him um, in his youth. And when he converted away from communism, he points back to a moment when he was looking at his daughter's ear, Mm -hmm. his baby girl, and saying, there's no way that perfect ear came about by chance. And he says that thought was a seed that grew. Mm -hmm. And the, the communism couldn't squash it. So even when he wrote his book Witness, you know, it, closer to the end of his life, kind of reflecting on his experience and what what he'd learned, he still saw this crisis of history as something that was coming. So the the Quaker faith that he came to, he acknowledged, you know, my my theology is weak. I'm a, I'm a baby in these things. But the peace of Christ is totally antithetical to communism. And the way he talks about it is very personal, very experiential. So, but it's it was in the company of the Quakers that he sensed the peace of Christ. But you can see the direct opposition in the way that he's framing his thinking. Mm-hmm between Christ and communism. Um, There was still some sense of a crisis, still some sense of we are coming to the end of something huge and it's not going to be clean and it's not Mm -hmm. going to be nice. And in some ways he was right. Since we've Mm -hmm. watched history unfold since then, it has not been clean. What we're seeing now is not clean and crisp and bright and rainbows and puppy dogs. Uh, It's vicious. The tares are more obviously tares. We're waiting for the wheat to become more obviously wheat. <laughs> yeah. Wheat looks rather sickly right now. Uh, and and Chambers died believing that for himself, for his own heart, Christ was sufficient, but not really being able to see that there was any answer for society, for the nations, for the world, for organized mm-hmm. society. Yeah, in part because he his inclination was localist mm-hmm. and that he he and his wife bought a farm and intentionally wanted to raise their children apart from the hustle and bustle mm-hmm. um, they didn't watch tv or listen to the radio they wanted to be close to the land because mm-hmm. that's what they thought was best for the souls of their children mm-hmm. which i have a i have a real sympathy for that perspective <laughs> Well, if God calls you to be a farmer, that's great. (laughs) But if it's a way of running away from life, then maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. And so here we stand. And within, I haven't heard so much about in the last couple of years, but for a while there, a lot of Christians were fleeing to the mountains, fleeing to obscure, uninhabited states, (laughs) thinking that if you get up in the mountains, you get far away, then it will be better. Well, in some ways, of course, it's better. You don't have government officials poking their nose in all the time. And you can fly under the radar and probably in some places, certainly any place outside of California, it's probably cheaper, cleaner on a lot <laughs> of levels. And, and you know, but as you look back at the New Testament epistles, you never find Paul writing to, say, the church in Corinth and saying, boy, you guys have such problems with, with sexual immorality and, and dishonesty and schism. Why don't you all get together and move up into the man- mountains of Ararat? That'd be a great spot. You <laughs> get won't out be of pl- Corinth. That's the problem Corinth. with the Corinth Corinthian is the church. Problem. Go move someplace else. 
or to the church in Rome. You, you, don't you know the Antichrist is going to arise in Rome? What are you all doing there? Get out. Go someplace else. Go where it's safe. Safe for your families. <laughs> <laughs> you can read the whole the whole New Testament, and you're not going to find that. Oh my goodness! I have a I have a fun tangent about mm -hmm. the Antichrist in Rome. Yeah. I was reading reading an Anglican reformer's work, and he he's arguing, of course, that the the whore of Babylon is, and yeah. all that the Pope is the Antichrist, and we know this because. Rome is the only city founded on seven hills. That was his argument. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you Google cities founded on seven hills, <laughs> Wikipedia will give you a list. It is a long <laughs> list. <laughs> and he's like, we know it's not Jerusalem because Rome was founded on seven hills. Jerusalem was also founded, founded on, on seven, seven hills. hills. I know <laughs> this, yes. No <laughs> one ever mentions he didn't. this. <laughs> so anyway, sorry, that was a tangent. No, that's me. Mm -hmm. um, and Jeremiah, and, and, and think back here to... Dr. Schaefer's book, Death in the City, he makes a big mm -hmm. point of this, that God did not have Jeremiah write to those in captivity and say, Babylon, oh, stinks to be you guys. Look for any chance you can to get, get out of there. At least go to, you know, someplace safer like, uh, I don't know, Greece. Yeah, that'd be a good move. <laughs> uh, or, or Egypt. Or, well, wait, they, they, they tried to take, they took Jeremiah there by force and that wasn't part of God's plan. Well, it's got to be someplace better than Babylon. Just get out of Babylon. It, it doesn't happen. He says, settle down, plant gardens, plant fields, build houses, have kids. The captivity's long. Mm -hmm. And, and pray for, for the, the peace. You're in it for the long haul. Pray for the peace of the city you settle in. But they're mm -hmm. pagan cities founded upon magical principles around some local deity. Yeah, they really need your prayers, don't they? <laughs> There's two ways of looking at this. That this is too wicked for us to take, or this is too wicked for us not to attack with the gospel. And if you believe in a sovereign God who has the power to change hearts and lives, and who is well-intentioned toward humanity, that's a little bit different than if you have a weak, puny God who may or may not, you know, depending on whether you're, at this point, Arminian or Calvinist, loves, loves everybody but can't do a thing about it, or only <laughs> loves a very few people, and it's predestined them, and they're getting out, but to let the world burn. Um, you know, now there's nothing really encouraging in any of that. Mm -mm. But when you have a God who's promised to bless all nations, although not the way you think are on your timetable, but for real, then you can hope that what you are doing today counts in, in the long game. You may not know why. You may not know how. But God put us here. He's planned it out. He is not a God who wastes energy. What we are doing is eternally significant. And we just have to wait till the end, until the whistle blows, the trumpet sounds, and then maybe God will explain some of it. Or maybe we'll talk to somebody in heaven who says, oh, you're that guy? Do you know what happened because you did that stupid thing over there? This happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and then I got saved, and then I went out and evangelized five nations. And what? <laughs> I was just having a bad day. I thought I was just yelling at people. Well, you were yelling, you were, but it was the gospel that came out of your mouth while you were yelling. And, you know, that started... <laughs> You mean God uses me when I'm at, I'm in a, have a bad I'm in a bad mood? Uh huh. Because if we, He waited until we were perfect, <laughs> He'd have no instruments to work with. Uh, when when I was younger and, and before, there was a saying that God will never use an unclean vessel. <laughs> ha! <laughs> and and sometimes God is most glorified by using unclean vessels. Think of Samson. Think of mm -hmm. Jacob. You know, people criticize them left and right, and sometimes not completely correctly, but sometimes so. But it's not about them in any case. Mm -hmm. It's about the power of God. It's about the power mm -hmm. of God's Spirit. And and so I, I would say again, we're, we're back to two things we need to believe about God. One, He is sovereign. There's your Calvinism kicking in. He ordains the, the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand, I'll do all my will. He's got it. Secondly, his plans for the world are what we would reckon as good. He wants to reconcile the world to himself. And in Christ, he's already done so. He wants to save the world. He wants to bless all nations. Well, if he's not sovereign, doesn't matter what he wants. Yeah. If he's sovereign, but doesn't really care, and is content to just save a handful of people, even though it cost him a son, 
then that's those are two very different theologies. Well, when you can put the two together and say, sovereign God, who means the world infinitely well, yes, there will be people who will go to hell. Yes, there will be nations who will be smashed. Yes, there will be war and suffering. But at the end of it, the end of the story, we will sit back and the universe will applaud the grace and mercy of a sovereign, infinitely wise God. That's a side to be on. And that's hope to live by. And it's hope for right now. I, I don't know what the next year will bring us. I don't know if the next six months are going to bring us. But it, you know, we all like uh, action adventure movies, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean we want to live one. <laughs> well, you know what? We're stuck in one anyway. So <laughs> now's the time to appreciate it. And the only way we can do that is taking God at his word, believing that God is sovereign, that he means us well. We being his people and ultimately the world. And that if we live in that, there's hope and we don't need to despair. I, I would love to be able to go back in time and talk to Whitaker Chambers mm -hmm. and explain to him, look, you're looking at the power of communism. What if I told you that within, let's see, I'm not sure when he died, but let's put it probably around the late 50s, early 60s. Within 20 years, communism is going to collapse. The Soviet empire will break apart. Uh, West Germany will st will be reunited with East Germany. The wall will come down. Berlin will be one city. Um, all these people that you're afraid of are going to be dead. And the church will be evangelizing and translating the Bible into more languages you don't even know about right now. And we'll have these new technologies by which we can reach every part of the person on the planet in God's time. And World War III will not have happened, and, the, and Armageddon will not have happened, and the Gospel will still be going on. Do you think maybe that if he could... But the thing is, we don't need to know that. We don't need someone coming from the future to tell us it's going to be okay. We simply need to believe the promise of God. And that's what mm -hmm. it means to live by faith. Yeah. Awesome. Let's wrap up with some recommendations. But, but you know, there are times when saying that, making that transition is just, it feels like a little bit of a a letdown? I don't know. We've been talking about such grand things and, you know, <laughs> such big hopes and faith and stuff. And now it's like, well, what did I have for breakfast today? <laughs> <laughs> well, but no. See, it should, but it shouldn't. That's the flesh getting in the way. That's saying, mm -hmm. this is grand. Let's go out and, and storm City Hall or take over the Capitol <laughs> building or take over NORAD. And, or at least Hollywood, let's go out and change things right now. How about let's go have a cup of tea and watch an old movie and read a good book and play with yeah. our grandchildren? Well, that, that doesn't do anything. No, no. That does everything. <laughs> it's living out life in the light and in the shadow of God's promises. Mm -hmm. uh, people who are full of themselves, whose souls are lifted up to pride, it has to be all about them. They have to go out and fix everything. Hmm. And if you don't, if they if you don't jump on their bandwagon, you're a traitor. You're a failure. You're handing the world to the bad guys. Come on, get out here and help. Well, you know what? I'd rather spend the evening watching Casablanca with my girls if I could just keep my oldest daughter awake through it. <laughs> um, and that's too is the kingdom of God. And we go to church on Sunday and we worship the Lord of Heaven and Earth. And God makes even our enemies to be at peace with us his way. And so it is absolutely appropriate that we stop and say, okay, so what did you have for breakfast today? Or what book are you reading? Or what's your favorite piece of music right now? Or you got a new pet in your house? Or what's Gretchen's first Christmas going to be like? So anyway. The living part of the living in faith. The living, living faith. part, exactly. Not living in terror, not living on the ragged edge, but just living because God's that big. So, what do you got? <laughs> I'm going to recommend homemade applesauce. Mm. Uh, I got together with a lady in my church who knows how to can and make applesauce and all sorts of cool stuff like that that I want to learn how to do. Um, and we had a lovely morning making applesauce. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Gretchen uh. doesn't like it. <laughs> She's an Aww. ungrateful little child. <laughs> Um, my wife just had a bunch of girlfriends over last night and they watched some random rom-com. I'm going to recommend rom-coms, romantic comedies. Hey. Um, now I'm a guy and therefore by definition not supposed to like them and they're not my favorite genre, I'll be honest. But 
when it is done well, when it is done with a touch of humanity and with at least some conscious or unconscious nod to the gospel, to true love, and to purpose and to meaning. Uh, romance and marriage, courtship are some of the funniest, entertaining things in life, and they make for stories that go on for generations. Well, let me tell you about when grandma met grandpa. You know, it just keeps <laughs> going on and on. Tell daddy, tell us how you and mommy met and how you fell in love. And uh, well, we met each other and said, uh, might, as, might as well, and we went, got hitched. That's boring. Come on, what really happened? <laughs> That's basically what David and I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's more to your story than that. I, I may even know things you don't know. So anyway, there is something to be said for the better rom-coms, the better romantic comedies, as they make us face what it means to be human, to love, mm -hmm. to lose, to fight to get back, to fight to hold on to a relationship that's worth holding on to. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the background for all of this is what Jesus did for us. He came as the divine bridegroom to win us. And we weren't always a willing bride. In fact, the runaway bride would be a good title for the church. <laughs> um, no, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, yet he pursues. And if I had thought about it, I'd come up with an entire list of names of rom-coms and fit them together in one elaborate parody of the gospel. But I, <laughs> I didn't foresee this was going this way. But folks at home, you can try this. Look, look at some of your, uh, your favorite romantic comedies and see how the titles and the themes play out into the gospel. Now, do, are all these producers and directors and writers and actors self-consciously Christian? No. But to tell a story that touches humanity they at least have to get some of it right. Yep. And in there, there can be humor and delight and joy. And as Christians, we can see further and say, now, if they had just had this happen, <laughs> or this is the place where all the Christians in the room should get down and start praying, or this is where the pastor should walk up and say, not so fast, bud. You know, or this is where the father should say, all right, let's open the Bible. And But um, rom-coms. Mm -hmm. Christmas is coming up. <laughs> there are plenty of good Christmas rom-coms. There are rom -coms. plenty of good Christmas rom-coms. Yeah. I always okay. think of Oscar Wilde's line from The Importance of Being Earnest, where he says, the essence of romance is uncertainty. <laughs> mm. And there's something to that. There something to the ambiguity, the chase. Um, another one of our mutual friends was talking recently about the difference between Hebrew as a language and Greek as a language. Yeah. Where Hebrew is all about the ambiguity. Mm. And the shades of meaning and the yes. poetry and the images. Greek is like a scalpel. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> need a surgical strike mm. of meaning. You use Greek, which mm. he argues is why the Old Testament is in Hebrew and the New Testament is in Greek. <laughs> but that's a story for another day. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you would like to send us a message, you can open up an email to haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. That's the best way to get in touch with us. A uh, big thank you also to our financial supporters. Thanks for keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join the number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion, or our Patreon, patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion. Thanks so much for listening again. Have a good night.